My name is Daniel Dazi. Many thanks for joining us. So we begin with the Fisheries Minister, Elizabeth Afolekwe, who is justifying the decision to implement a closed season for artisanal fishermen in May and June this year, while those involved in heavy industrial fishing will observe the season in August and September this year. Even though scientists have indicated that the month of August is more appropriate to observe the closed season, uh, the minister insists fishermen can benefit from some minimal production uh, adding that traditional activities, including the celebration of festivals, informed their decision. She spoke at a news conference this morning. Uh, I must admit that we believe uh, science has told us and the fishermen themselves have also um, given us reasons to believe what science has told us. We work the fisheries ministry is made up and the fisheries commission is made up of people, uh, fishery scientists, largely made up of fishery scientists. And so we work with science, we depend on science. Um, it is true that the peak production period is within uh, a certain period um, which peaks in August. It peaks in August. So we would have expected that the close season would have been um, for all the, the fleets, the inshore fisheries, the artisanal sector, and the industrial sector uh, would have all agreed to do the close season in August when uh, there's peak production. Um, unfortunately, the artisanal sector believes that um, their festivals are really important to them. And so they chose the 15th of May to the 15th of June. The reason why we um, agreed with what the, the suggestion that they came up with is that there's some minimal production around that time. And the industrial trawlers exploit heavier the resource than the artisanal sector. And so if the industrial sector is doing their close season within the peak production period, which is August to September, then uh, we believe that there's still going to be some, um, some benefits. And so the artisanal sector have decided to do this during the minimal uh, production period and the industrial sector which exploits heavier on the resource um, have agreed to do this in August and we believe that there's still going to be some benefits. So uh, this is the beginning of a very good um, program, a very good um, um, program within the fishery sector. Uh, this is the beginning where the artisanal sector uh, will, for the first time, do a close season. So we agreed with them to do it within this period, uh, which will make them more compliant, um, so that in, in coming years, when they see the benefits accruing, then gradually they'll be shifting towards the peak production period. Now, when asked about an alternative source of livelihood, the minister noted that government cannot provide direct monetary or financial support to fishermen during the closed season. Instead, the ministry will provide or improve its supply of subsidized fishing inputs, which she believes will go a long way to improve their livelihoods. The states cannot, we cannot go out and say we are uh, giving out monies to fishermen. But what we can do uh, is to uh, improve our supply of the fishing inputs. Um, most of the fishermen uh, do fishing the wrong way. Most of them do illegal, unreported, and non-regulated fishing. Um, chief amongst these uh, uh, bad practices is the use of lights the use of light and the application of chemicals to the fish that we consume. And 
we, we have engaged with them and we know that the reason why most of them, especially within the artisanal sector, use light to exploit the resource is because they are not, now they are not getting enough fish. And so they apply the light to the, to the fish and the fish aggregates around the light and then they apply chemical um, and so they can scoop all the fish that aggregate around the light. And that is not good for the health of the consumer. And so um, we, we, when we bring them the approved fishing nets, when we bring them their outboard motors, when we bring them the, the fishing nets that are used to exploit the resource in the right way, then we believe that it will be, it will help to, to um, sort of build, rebuild the stocks. Now, um, that was the Minister for Fisheries, but how do the fishermen feel about this? The AM shows Roland Walker has been asking them. And so we need to put all the matters into perspective. We know that there's been consistent decline in the industry as we've witnessed over the last couple of years. But it's also because the depleting fish stock has a great connotation on the survival of not only the industry, but those who tend to ply their trade in it. Well, I have uh, some young people. Many of them also have had some great experiences over the years, if not decades, in fishing. And um, I have Kwesi. Kwesi Okai uh, has great experience, and, but of course uh, he's going to speak in fancy. Uh, and we also know that even though we're in Accra, there's uh, some great migration as far as uh, the coastal belt is uh, related from those who either do their fishing along the Fanti coast or those who do it in the Ghana coast and those who do it in the Epe coast. Uh, Kwesi, what's that then? Hey, yo. Okay. Uh, also, what's that Kwame Ata. Kwame, Kwame Ata. Okay. So they come from Professor Tamil's hometown, the, the, the late president of our republic. But it's instrumental that we situate the conversation the way it has to be. Now, put it maybe so. See, see, and you there last year, and then she no, uh, uh, them close, uh, open and close fishing season. No, Zaba. See, see, and what better way them introduction, Nibio. Why didn't you own it today? I not know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I I don't know. I don't I don't I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I do I don't I don't know. I do you <laughs> Especially with uh, fishing trawlers, ne walk deep into the sea, and now why them fishing into Oma and I'm not open. I'm not doing that. Okay, no kwa. No kwa. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. You're going to put this fishing boat. What do you say? I am not going to put the fishing boat in so. What the number that one day? I see there. I am going to put one month. We're going back home. The other one, I'm fishing for the cycle. I'm going to set up the pa. And you can't come as my wassy. In the Iama for in two ties. When you're new to be out there, more about you is carbine room for seniors are buying room for Sibia. As I buy a room for Sukrampa, in a one man, I am an is a buying room for Suba, only as you have first day, maybe you and yet this is there. I buy two men scaling one to my man and Yankola, or two or care, one office away and I would talk. Of any way, you are smart to go get your pay. Yes, the Apiana, a pin, maybe what three weeks. Two weeks. Never go and yet. That's why you my every time you have a force of Yabaho. And see, I buy Nimbua, I buy one promise. I buy my inner Yatokuma, I fear Carpetu, near the Basso Pong or Bocao, 
Well, just by way of uh, translation or interpretation of what he said, uh, just uh, starting from how he ended, he says, of course, uh, the main uh, positives of, of, or the help that they tend to get from government will be the assistance that they tend to get by way of the subsidies and the premix fuel that they get by way of their location and subsequently also that form of assistance that is offered to them by way of their leadership uh, especially when they have to go to sea but consistently over time they've seen that they've had some main dependence on the industry because uh, it, it's their main line of trade they, they haven't learned any form of trade as they've grown up and them having the the, the, the concern that government wants to have an open as well as a close fishing season is going to have some repercussions on the way they live. Or also, some fishermen at Elmina in the central region are demanding explanation from the National Petroleum Authority and government as to why the color and content of the premix fuel has changed in recent times. According to the fishermen, the current content of premix fuel sold to them is destroying their outboard motors and making life unbearable for them. The fishermen are also asking the National Petroleum Authority to explain why they should buy premix fuel at an exorbitant price contrary to what has been agreed upon. At a news conference held at Elmina on Tuesday, spokesperson for the fishermen, Amano Marquesen, said government should rethink the closed season it seeks to implement this year. All these are fishermen from Elmina. Now today they've gathered here, they have a message that from January they have noticed some changes in the premix fuel that is sold to them and they are not happy with it. They are asking government and the MPA to come clear why there is no oil in the premix fuel and then why the premix fuel has no color because what they know is that the premix fuel has a color and there is an oil in it. Now, these are two premix fuel that I have here. This is the current one that is being supplied. It has no color, it has no oil in it, and the fishermen are complaining bitterly. This is the color of the premix fuel. The fishermen say they know. It has a color blue, and there is oil in it. And they are asking the MPA why the situation is so. No, I am one day. For January, by February, petrol will come on. The whole kind of petrol, no. You want to call it beer, no? I know. You want to oil beer, no? And the people be say, "Abana day." It is extremely surprising that the premix fuel that is supplied to us since January has no color and oil in it. The color used to be blue. We are demanding answers from government and the MPA. Secondly, we want to ask the MPA if it is their decision to make us pay money for five gallons when indeed we are supplied four gallons of premix fuel. No, today, Ben. You better be the MPA for that. I want to watch the petrol. No, four gallons. So far, four for five gallons, sir. So the fishermen here are distraught. They are throwing a challenge to government to seize the petrolers on the sea for like six months. It is in that case that they would want to agree with government to close the season. Otherwise, they are not going to agree to the closing of the season because they see that there will not even be any impact at all. So they want government to stop the petrolers and then uh, improve upon their livelihoods. There was I disagree with them on this close season. I think they have their own motive for doing this. This will not have any impact on the I have been in this fishing business for the past 35 years. Look at the petrolers. They have been given legitimacy by government to destroy the sea. And they want to stop us from getting our daily bread. When they close the season and they are still engaging in these trolling, what impact will they have 
upon our sea. They should allow us to go on with our business. They are asking or they are quizzing the Minister of Fisheries whether if he goes on leave for one month, she will not be paid. If she will be paid, then they are demanding that the fishermen who are also going to lay down their tools for one month, they are also expected to be paid. Away from the fishery sector, but still with supply of fuel, this time to another entity, uh, the Institute of Energy Security, IES, says its checks have revealed that claims by the Energy Ministry that a gas pipeline was destroyed and sabotaged in the Tema Enclave is untrue. In the statements, the group claimed the pipe being referred to as a gas pipeline is rather an under-construction oil pipeline belonging to Cyrus Energy, which is currently filled with just raw water. They claim the pipeline does not even belong to VRA. Executive Director of the Institute of Energy Security, Parkwisi Anamwasichi, joins me by telephone for more on this. Mr. Anamwasichi, thanks for joining us. What more um, did you state in that statement you released? Hello, Mr. Hello. Anamwasichi, are you there? Hello, Daniel. Great. Uh, thanks for joining us, Mr. Anamwasichina. You are saying that what the Energy Ministry has stated is untrue. What do you mean by that? Hello, Mr. Anamwasichi. For me, Daniel, but your line is very faint. Yes. Um, if you can hear me now, I am it's asking. Better. Yes, I am asking that. Uh, what exactly is the import of your statements? You believe some things that the Energy Ministry is saying is untrue. All right, Daniel, if I got to right, um, what I know very well is that we all know the situation that we find ourselves in. 2012 to 2016 was quite uncomfortable for us. We lost as a country both in economic and social terms. And so if we get any indication that beyond the financial challenge that we have in the sector, some group of people have made their work to destroy energy infrastructure, it become quite um, a challenge for us. And for that reason, we'll condemn this act because it is not good for the country. However, what we found on the ground is quite different from what the ministry seeks to put across. When it comes to the tower that was cut down, the minister alluded to a political sabotage. In fact, an action like this leads to compromising the work of the security agencies. And if they have any evidence that we don't have, they only need to tender it into this agency to work. Next, we move to this pipeline that we, say, we hear that it's a VRA pipeline. Our own investigation, while we went on the ground, indicates that it, it's not tied to any power infrastructure in the country. And it's just for thorough oil services. And at the time that we visited, the pipeline just contained raw water. And so... When you create this fear and panic, knowing very well that we have our own challenge, but then minister and his cause are using political sabotage when it doesn't exist, and it's far, it's far from what we hear, it becomes quite a concern. And so we rather we want to ask the ministry to concentrate on bringing a sustainable action or measure to forestall the recurring prolonged blackout that we have rather than mm. resorting to issues or mm. measures that we rather we want to bring them some form of sympathy from the public unnecessarily. But of course, Mr. Anamwasechi, this is not the only incident that occurred. The ministry has reported that on Daniel, about 12 different to occasions, if I may land. I Great. I, I was just saying that this did not occur in a vacuum. On about 12 different occasions, uh, the ministry says that some of its infrastructure has been tampered with. Are you not concerned as a player in the sector? Daniel, we, we, are, we are quite worried about a uh, person tampering with this infrastructure, because apart from affecting the work of our companies, it also can bring harm to human beings and animals as well. If it's an oil spillage that we have, it's going to degrade the environment. And so it is not good. It is something that will appeal to the public to desist from, because it is not good. It also has its own economic implications. 
because if they are not able to do their work, it affects our own gross domestic product and all that. So it's something we condemn. But it's not something that we can say it's a reason for which we have the do so at hand. Now, Ms. Adam Wasichi, I, I understand you're finding it difficult to hear me, but my question was, this did not happen in a vacuum, in that on other incidents with other installations, we have seen, you know, some tampering with infrastructure. Does that holistic picture not concern you? If somebody had an intention uh, politically to sabotage this way, I am not sure they will come close to uh, the inner city and close to a great coal, um, you know, office in Tema. They rather have gone to the bush where there's a lot of the pylons and towers running through to hack it down. For whatever reason, I'm sure that is why we have the security agencies and we are saying that we should allow them to work. And if any person or group of persons believe that there is this sabotage, please present your, your evidence to them to aid in their investigation. Are you also not drawing that conclusion that it cannot be? With these statements you just made that if someone wants to sabotage the system, the person could move further into, um, uh, should I say, a rural area? I, I don't have any reason to add political or military sabotage. All I'm asking is let's leave the security agencies to do their work. And if any Ghanaian, if you have an evidence of such a nature, whether by military or political or personal, please let's hand it over to them because it is for our own good that they will, should be able to find out this criminal and bring them to book. Thank you very much, Pakwitiano Mwaseshi, for joining us. Thank you. Away from the energy sector, government says calls by the minority in parliament for a value for money audit and a copy of the attorney general's advice, or should I say a copy of the value for money audit, ahead of the launch of the Sino-Hydro agreement um, with China is uncalled for. Now, the minority in parliament yesterday asked governments to suspend the launch of the $2 billion Sino-Hydro infrastructure project, demanding a value for money audit and a copy of the Attorney General's advice on the deal. Addressing journalists at a news conference, Information Minister Kojo Opon Kruma said, the documents in question are available, but cannot be a prerequisite for approving an agreement. First of all, there is no rule that a value for money audit is a prerequisite for parliamentary approval. It has never been the case. Um, there are two agreements that always go to parliament. There's the financing agreement, which talks about the terms of the um, financial arrangements for a particular transaction. And then there is usually the technical agreement, which deals with the technical specifications of a particular project. So the financing agreement will go to the finance committee. Then the um, commercial agreement, or I, I mean, I beg your pardon, the technical agreement will go to the committee responsible. If it's roads, it will go to the roads um, subcommittee. If it's a hospital, it will go to the uh, health subcommittee. And value for money has never been a prerequisite. And that's why parliament was able to go ahead and give parliamentary approval. If, however, parliament requires a value for money audit, parliament will request for it subsequently. There is a value for money um, um, audit report that has been prepared by, I think, the Ghana Institute of uh, Surveyors. It's been submitted through um, to the Roads Ministry, which spells out the various areas of potential risk and uh, gives a specification on it, that um, the risk associated with this transaction is low, whether you talk of the contractor, the commercial terms, and all of it. So it is not true that there's no value for money audit. There is a, a, um, a value for money audit, which is available. I've cited it myself. Um, but it is not even a prerequisite. And if um, our good friends on the minority require that, they can request for it through parliament, and it will be made um, available uh, to them. Secondly. The Attorney General is involved ab in issue whenever an agreement is being signed. So before the agreement comes to Parliament, the Attorney General is involved and has cited it and has made whatever recommendations, whatever opinion is required before it goes to Cabinet for approval and then comes to Parliament for subsequent approval. 
again, when it comes to parliament for approval, if for any reason you require um, the Attorney General to provide you with uh, um, um, a brief, you request in parliament. It is not after the fact that parliament has given approval, parliament has satisfied itself that all the legal requirements have been met and has given approval, then you see that there's no advice from the Attorney General uh, or there's no value for money. I think it's becoming obvious that our friends in the minority uh, really do not desire the Sino Hydro transaction to go for because every step of the way they have sought to put an impediment in our way, whether it's about not participating in the vote in parliament or writing to the IMF or now raising these questions about value for money or um, you know the AG's advice. These are non issues. I think for us, we're happy. Right, we stay with this story, and correspondent Martina Bugri has been monitoring the Tamale flyover sword cutting events. Let's speak to her now. Martina, what can you report currently from the ground? Uh, the ceremony just ended a while ago. Um, the president has been talking about the $2 billion infrastructure deal Ghana has gone into and the benefit it's going to bring to the people of the country. He talks of uh, roads that comes along with it. He talks of uh, both feeder roads and then um, bridges as well as flyovers that comes with it. He also talks of uh, hospitals, uh, water projects, among others that are part of the deal. And he says that this comes with more development and also opens up the uh, aluminium industry of the, the country. And so he says that it's a good deal for Ghana and they will follow it to the latter. He says that they will not tolerate any delays. And so in the next 13 months, um, these projects that the deal is coming with should be coming to an mm. end. Mm. Now, Martina, all members of parliament in the Tamale area are minority members of parliament. Haruna um, Idrisu, Inusa Fuseni, and Al Hassan Suhuyini. Were any of them there as a launch? I, I didn't see any of them. Those they introduced are basically uh, ministers of state and then some MPs who are from the minor, uh, majority who were part of the process. I didn't cite any of them, neither did I hear them introduced any of them. So just for the sake of emphasis, no member of the minority in parliament was seen by you in, in that event. That's the truth. Thank you very much, Martina Bugri, for joining us. Um, she's our correspondent in the northern region. And the minority in parliament, we stay with them, is demanding to know the whereabouts of the majority leader, Osei Chementa Bonzu, who has not been in the house this week. The minority chief whip, Munta Kamubarak, says the majority leader has no business traveling out of the country after extending sitting for a week. Listen. This is the last week, Friday, and he thought that there were a lot of business that needed to be covered this week, and therefore was insisting that we will have to sit until 12 of this month, that this week, Friday. The speaker sadly, the whole of this week, the majority of the who thought there is so much business in this house that needs to be done has not been here. And the speaker, my worry is if all other persons or members of parliament to cancel their programs to stay in this house, I thought the majority of the who thought it was important that this house stay this week should equally be here. And the speaker, Monday today, that three days gone, and I'm reliably informed, he traveled last night. Mr. Speaker, it may be important for his trip, but for him to ask us to stay for additional week, what he does not find necessary to cancel his program to stay in this house, Mr. Speaker, I think that is not a very fair issue. And I think it's important that I bring your attention to this because. When we were insisting that let's rise because of other important programs, he insisted that this week was critical to do some other things. And the, as critical as it may be, I do not understand why he would not find necessary to equally cancel his program so that all of us will be here. So we got to admit to the fact that if I cannot speak for anybody, I can speak for myself. Committed and dedicated to sit every time, early in the morning, from beginning to the end. And most of the time, trying to help this house run. And we thought that the least the majority of us would do 
was with him often for this week in the Adi. Will have stayed the whole of this week to help the, 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 the house run the business. Or put it in the figure. It's it been happening throughout this week. And it's part now, Deputy Majority Leader Sarah Hajo Safo has rather been questioning the whereabouts of the minority leader. Both leaders had traveled to Qatar to attend a meeting of the Interparliamentary Union in Qatar last week. But Muntaka Mubarak says ma the majority leader has traveled out again. Rather surprised and disappointed in the issue that has been raised by the um, minority chief with the speaker. The reason I am is that the submission will suggest that indeed the entire leadership cannot function without this minority leader. The speaker, as you can see, the minority leader is open. But he is here because Mr. Speaker, it is not for any reason that in the wisdom of the drafted or the framework of our standing orders and the constitution that we have five members who form leadership on both sides. Mr. Speaker, and Mr. Speaker, and we are with them as well. You have two different speakers with you. Mr. Speaker, the purpose for having this now to some good news now, and a child delivery center is near completion at Mangotideke, a village in the Volta region, where the chief doubles as midwife and carries out deliveries on the bare floor. Construction of the center, which can also be used as a clinic for the village, started after a Joy News Hotline documentary left behind. The documentary highlighted the plight of pregnant women in the village, with the chief as its midwife. With financial support from a WhatsApp group called Paddies, a lecturer at the Ho Technical University, Dr. Divine Novieto is confident the center will soon be completed and handed over to the community. Gifty and Oapia reports. It's a Saturday morning here at Mango Tideke, a moment of togetherness for the women here. I've come to follow up on progress of work ongoing on a child delivery center. Happy go. Is 25 years and one of a couple of pregnant women at the moment. She's expecting her third child. She is considered the luckiest as all the women here want to be the first to have a child at the delivery center. This is the center. The construction began after a Joy News documentary left behind highlighted how women in labor are delivered on the bare floor and sometimes on the floor of a bathroom. The phenomenon is about to end because of a lecturer at the Ho Technical University, Dr. Divine Novieto, who was moved by the story. I got uh, uh, to this particular project through a documentary that I watched on uh, Joy News. So we started with uh, a few appeals to friends and realized that they were interested in it. And we are getting to the uh, roof level. After the roof level, we'll do the finishings and then uh, hand it over to the community. The next phase is for us to roof it and then do the finishings. Here we are going to do some tiling in and then do the, the, the doors and then the windows. So yes, there are some, some other items to, uh, to uh, some processes to, uh, to carry out before we complete the project. But I don't think it's uh, unsurmountable. The structure will bring a lot of things. So first, help, self-help uh, spirit that has been uh, reinvigorated. Secondly, the structure to help. And then the thirdly, because the support staff may probably come for the chief so that he can also uh, 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 know that when he is no more or uh, he cannot practice, somebody else is there. Part of those he reached out to is a group of professional friends on a WhatsApp group called The Paddies. They have been the financiers so far. It started as a, a WhatsApp social media group. We decided to take it beyond fun and touch lives and society. And when we saw the story, we were, we were really touched. The executives uh, discussed realized that it was something we want to support. We sold it to the, the group and the group uh, bought into it. Paddies cannot do this all alone. Even though we are committed to contribute more, we expect all the other stakeholders, the assembly and the regional health directorate, we expect the MP and all the opinion leaders around the area to come to support. 
Many thanks to the Paddy's WhatsApp group. And of course, congratulations to Gifty and Wapiade was behind that story, left behind. It's now time for business. And when Daryl comes, he will be telling you how the city depreciation has pushed March inflation marginally up to 9.3%. All that and more after this.